Performance Summit sponsored by TD Wealth. We're hearing from a number of speakers and one has just an incredible story. Imagine you were diagnosed with brain cancer and they found a brain tumor in your 20s. Then imagine that you uh, helped with the diagnosis and then found all the data and wanted to spread that to the world to help them understand how important it is to have your own health data. That is the story of Stephen Keating. He just finished his PhD in mechanical engineering at MIT. His story is nothing short of incredible. In a Money Talk exclusive, I had a chance to sit down with him. Here's that conversation. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm back in Canada. So I had Tim Hortons last night and it was great. I'm originally from Calgary, but I'm living down in the States now after just finishing graduate school. Um, your, your story is nothing short of absolutely incredible, from not just what happened to you, to your recovery, to what you're doing with, I'd say, what's happened to you, I mean, you, how you're talking about it. So just tell me, what happened? I was really fortunate, but it was also I, it was because of my curiosity and serendipity that I'm still alive today. So I've always been interested in data. And I think everyone is when they're a kid. And what I realized when I was at MIT is everyone at MIT had retained that same childlike curiosity and it got them to where they are, always asking why. So I would often volunteer for research studies growing up just because I wanted to help science, but I was also curious. Yeah. And in 2007, I was at Queen's University and I volunteered for a brain scan. I wanted to help science and I wanted to see my brain. And the results came back and it showed actually a small abnormality in the MRI scan. Uh, the doctors weren't concerned, I didn't have any symptoms, I got it rechecked, rescanned uh, by neurologists. They didn't know what it was, but they said let's check it in a few years. So I got it rescanned in 2010, the abnormality hadn't changed, I kind of went about my life. But I, ha I had the data. Uh, then at, in 2014, I was in my PhD studies at MIT, I started to smell a faint vinegar smell. Just for a few seconds a day, kind of like when you hit your arm and it goes funny for yeah. you know, a few seconds. It was like that, but with a faint vinegar smell. And after about the third day, I was in my bed, and that happened, and I went up to the kitchen, no one was cooking, and I kind of was like, that's a little odd. And I remembered I had the brain data. So Did you back. put that together right there? You said, yeah, I was, you know, I was, when I was in my bed, and I was like, there's no vinegar anywhere. Why, what am I smelling? Yeah. And it had kind of just been, you know, happening for a few days before. And uh, I went back to that brain data and realized that abnormality that was near the smell center of the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, so, again, I wasn't too worried, but I just thought that's curious enough, I should maybe get another scan. Went to the doctors, these were new doctors now, told them the story, they weren't actually concerned, I still didn't really have symptoms in their mind, uh, but I pushed and so they booked another MRI scan for a month later. Uh, and so I kind of still thought it wasn't a big deal because there wasn't much concern. But thank goodness you pushed, and, that's a different uh, story. Yeah, and I actually came back for Calgary Stampede and the, the smelling things had stopped. So I don't know if it was more sleep or more alcohol from the stampede, <laughs> uh, but I kind of had brushed away in my mind thinking, okay, I'll probably be okay. I had the scan and it actually showed a, a brain tumor uh, that large. And that's, uh, that's real size. Tumor. Yeah, this is, this is life size. So I've actually got the MRI scans here that are actually 3D printed, so you can wow. actually see the size of the tumor there in the frontal left lobe. Um, that's that's, a, that's about, about the size of a baseball, about 10% of my brain. That's um, um, how, how, when you saw that when they came back to you and yeah. said, you know, what was what was your reaction? So usually the doctors are the ones who tell you the results of the scan, but the technician who did the scan said you you can't leave you can't leave the hospital. You have a you have a huge tumor, and uh, I actually started to smell that vinegar smell right there. It triggered it, it triggered one of those. Now what we know are seizures. Uh, so seizures are really any type of abnormal neural activity which can include smell. And uh, three weeks later I had a 10 hour awake brain surgery and uh, I was extremely fortunate to have this amazing community of professors at MIT. I could start to understand what was happening to me. I tried to gather as much data as I could. I even had to ask them, and they agreed to videotape my surgery. So it was a 10 hour awake surgery. So I'm actually talking. And they did that because why? Surgery. Because the tumor was actually, if you look at in the MRI, it's actually near, uh, near the language center of the brain. Mm -hmm. So what that means is I'll be talking through the surgery and when my voice starts to garble, they're cutting parts of the language center of my brain. Mm -hmm. So I would, was really able to talk about anything I wanted and as soon as they would hear parts of my language garbling, they would stop cutting. Mm -hmm. So I was talking about how I met my girlfriend, I was talking about all these things and it was a very surreal experience, especially to watch it afterwards to see what had happened to me. It's, I can't imagine, I mean, you're actually talking and someone's in your brain while you're talking. Yeah, I mean, it was incredible and I, I continued this trend of trying to gather as much data as I could, doing as many research studies as I could, asking for the data, 
generating my own data. For example, I was on chemotherapy for a year and I could feel it in my stomach. I wanted to see what it was doing to the bacteria in my stomach, my microbiome. So I did microbiome, you know, and you can do this online yourself. Every person can, just like with your Fitbit, you can actually measure your stomach bacteria through uh -huh. microbiome sites. And so you could actually, I could see that before, during and after chemo, there was huge changes in my stomach bacteria. So maybe in the future, we can do these research techniques such as, you know, swallowing pills with different amounts of bacteria to repopulate the populations. I, w I just want to ask you about the, the tumor, um, sure. because it, uh, if I understand correctly, you actually also cut stained and, and you actually yeah. examined your yeah. own tumor, didn't you? So I actually, so I collected a huge amount of data yeah. and it was mainly f because I, w I was curious, but I wanted to be able to use it to make decisions. There's, when you have a life threatening il illness or any illness, to be honest, you're often lost. You don't know which direction to go. There's lots of different treatment routes. There's lots of different approaches. And w what do you know what's best, right? So I wanted as much data as I could to make those decisions. It was over 200 gigabytes of data that I collected. But the most surprising thing I found was actually how hard it was to access all that data. I couldn't actually believe that the patient actually has the least access to, in the whole process. So for example, you know, we do have a legal right to our clinical data, but it's a, it's a path with barriers everywhere. So you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork. You have to wait for a few weeks in, for it to come in the mail, and it would come in 20 to 30 CDs. Now, I don't even have a CD reader on my computer, so I had to get one. And then you upload these 20, 30 CDs, and you have no tools to use the data. Yeah. And there's also a huge amount of legal gray zones that impede you from getting the, the really more valuable data, things like research data, things like access to patient tissue. So for example, I donated part of my brain tumor to be sequenced because they wanted to look at my sequence as it was a pediatric tumor. Right. I was of course under the impression I would have access to my own genetic sequence, my PhD minors in synthetic biology from MIT, I thought I could be able to understand it. Yeah. And my doctors and researchers had kind of given me this impression and of course after it happened and I had donated this tissue which as a scientist I know that's incredibly valuable yeah. to a research lab. I wasn't able to see my own genome even though researchers at my university at MIT were. And the reason was is because of the CLIA policy. It wasn't done on a CLIA certified machine, the sequencing. So, Sorry, what is that? So CLIA is a policy back from the 80s that basically means a machine, if it's getting back data to the patient, has to be certified. They want to make sure it's good data. Uh. Now the problem is, is for research labs, CLIA certification is going to cost tens of thousands of dollars and take time to do, and they have no interest in doing that if it's just for their research. So the same genetic sequencing machine that was used to sequence my genome has been CLIA certified by other groups, but this one hadn't been. Mm. So little things like that. For example, I wanted to see my own cancer, like you said, for, for the tumor and the tissue. Because you know when you break your arm, they show you the x-ray, right? You see, oh, there's the break in the arm, yeah. right? When you get cancer, you get a little paragraph. It says, you know, you have, you have cancer. You have a grade two slash grade three astrocytoma. And you can see the text. I wanted to see my own cancer. So the tumor was huge, right? Yeah. I mean, you can see this is the MRI printed in multi-materials. You can see the size of the tumor, right? And this it's just gives the people the size vacuum. also as well, how, yeah, what they a, actually had to do. This, this was the surgery. This is how they did it. They actually went in like this, opened up the skull there, and cut out the tumor. Um, and, and so you'd think that as a patient, you have I could have a tiny, tiny bit, like a, a a few cubic millimeters so that I could look at of it myself. Of your tumor. Right, so I could do my own yeah. microscopy. Of course not. I when you have surgery, you sign away all your rights to any tissue removed from you. So I was like, this is crazy. I can't even see my own tumor. I became a medical student. So I switched into the medical program, hmm. took a class in pathology, and then as my final project, I could now apply as a researcher for research access to my own tumor. And I got a little bit, and I was able to then run my own stains. I could do, IDH1 was the primary mutation, I could do an IDH1 antibody stain. I could get new information. And what I did with all this information was I put it online. And I did that because I wanted to be able to share it with friends, I wanted to tell my family what was going on, I wanted to share with other patients who were always asking me about what I was doing, and I wanted to share it with science, to advance research. And I, again, I found this huge lack of ability. There's not a Facebook, there's not a Dropbox, there's not a Google Maps for Health. I had to make my own website and put it up. But what I learned was even if you don't use the data to make decisions, by sharing it, it generates support. So my friends and family would email me back. They'd send me videos back. They would understand what I was going through. They would mm -hmm. understand what proton radiation was like, what chemotherapy was like from my perspective. And so I've been very active in um, my, a professor that I, that 
was studying the IDH1 mutation asked me to give a five-minute talk during his class. And I was a little nervous to talk about cancer publicly. Uh, but I owed him a lot, and I was grateful, so I gave a five-minute talk, and I couldn't believe the reaction. My six years of graduate work in 3D printing never had this reaction from this five-minute talk on brain cancer. Uh, it actually resulted in a New York Times article that was published on the front page, and I got thousands of emails that day from that. And from there, things have just uh, spiraled, and I, I have always just tried to say yes when I can try to help uh, do fundraising for cancer, promote patient data access, uh, talk about the future of where patients are actually in control of their own data. Let me ask you, I mean, because you're on a bit of a crusade almost with this. I mean, and really, you know, no one's more better equipped to talk about this than you. Do you think we're going to get it? Do you think we're moving to a place where Abs people will have absolutely. their own? Absolutely. I mean, if, so if you want to, you want to look at some data, right? You might, they might, you might think that I'm a white unicorn. Oh, this is a, a geek mm -hmm. from MIT who has the ability to understand all this genetic data and all this stuff. But what I'm trying to say is, no, it, it's going to be the everyday person who has the opportunity, if they want, to share their button, to share their data. Just look at your iPhone. It's got two million apps, right? Those two million apps you can download to your iPhone let you use data in many different ways. Yeah. And 90% of those apps are free. Now, you go to your hospital, there's zero apps, and even just getting your data is incredibly hard. So if we have a third-party API, that's an application program and interface, which means you could have the option to send your data to third-party external yeah. groups. Now you could say, yes, I'm okay with donating my blood work to this But you have to, to get it to group. it the first time, right? Right. Yeah. So as long as you have an API that's the hospital-driven. Right. And this is what I've been working on and promoting. And so, for example, I've been writing policy comments, and actually they updated the Meaningful Use Phase 3 in the states to require hospital APIs by 2018 to get financial incentives. So if that happens, and there's a lot going on with politics right now, so well, I don't know if it will, but if that happens by 2018, which is now the policy for Meaningful Use Phase 3, that means that American hospitals will have to have a third-party API. And what that'll do is basically let it grow organically, because now you're going to allow all these research groups, all these companies, to connect to the patient, to avoid the middleman of, of the hospital, to actually drive research from a patient-centric perspective. Let me ask you, um, it's, it's a, just an astounding story on so many levels, but for someone who's listening right now, and let's say somebody who's, who's ill, sure. who's seriously ill, what would be the one piece of advice you have for them? Yeah, so just ask for your data. And make sure your number one thing, so I, because this has gone public, I now get three to four emails a week from brain cancer patients mm. asking, what, what do you recommend? What should I do? Uh, and I think the most important thing is always to make sure you're asking the right questions. And that's a hard thing to know. And they found by lots of studies that a lot of the times patients won't ask the right questions and doctors won't bring things up. So you need to find other patient groups and figure out what are the right questions for your condition to be asking. Things like what clinical trials might be useful. So clinical trials are experimental drugs, right? But they're only offered at certain hospitals. So if you're at a hospital that doesn't offer this clinical trial, that doctor's probably not even going to bring it up because it's not available at that hospital. Yeah. Right? So simple questions like, what clinical trials are there? Where, where can I find more information about clinical trials? Things like clinicaltrials.gov. Where can I find patient groups? Things like patientslikeme.com. Mm. Where can I find you know, a second opinion, a third opinion? Asking those questions is, I think, the fir is the first point, and getting access to your data is the most important of those questions uh, in my mind. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for your time. It's an incredible journey. Yeah. Great. <laughs> And a reminder, please talk to your advisor, lawyer, or accountant to figure out what works best for you.